Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage AAPC and Emmons president, Dale Emmons. It's a beautiful day. Well, I can see that the uh, excitement in some of our breakout sessions is still going on. I was upstairs earlier. I was actually late getting down here. They had to send somebody to get me. Uh, but it's been a really a great conference, and we're excited at the progress we're making. So I'll welcome you to our luncheon, and I have a few housekeeping things I'd like to take care of uh, before we begin. But first, I want to thank the folks who made today's luncheon possible. Uh, NCC Media, Charter Media, Cox Media, Comcast Spotlight, Time Warner Cable Media. Join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> Following today's luncheon, we have the uh, Democratic and Republican boot camps that will be taking place, and I know that you won't want to miss those um, for your respective caucuses. We have also online, as I've reminded you throughout the conference, our online auction for our foundation to fund scholarships. I uh, hope that you'll go participate down on, on our website uh, in that uh, endeavor. As I reminded everyone this morning, we have a new Pandora radio station up. Uh, there's a link to it from our website. It's uh, a collection of 20 years of music that's been used in campaigns, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. I'd like to take a moment of uh, personal privilege. Is Anthony Bellotti in the room? I can't see. Does anybody see Anthony? Shout him out for me. <laughs> okay, well, let's have to skip that again. Maybe we'll get it to him on Sunday. I would like to at this time, to introduce to you uh, Tim Kay, Director of Political Strategy at NCC Media. Tim? Hey now, you're an all-star. Get your game on, go away. Thank you, Dale. Um, well, first thing I want to start and, and, and say, you know, thank you from the APC board and from Dale Emmons specifically for um, throwing just a great conference the last few days. You know, from the, the media buying, reviewing the media buying this morning, we had some overview of data and uh, polling yesterday and then the lunch. Um, you know, I, I've been in this town a long time and I've become a little bit of a cynic and I think when you hear people talk like that and it gets your, it gets your motor running and why you originally got in this business is to help people get elected. Um, I was joking with my wife yesterday that my first grader actually asked us to speak in front of her class and describe what we do for a living. And uh, now I'm convinced that I won't scare the kids and have them running out and forever not working in government and politics. Um, but as, as Dale said, my company, NCC Media, we're, we're owned by Comcast, Cox, and Time Warner. We're a sales and marketing research and technology company. Um, and what we do at post-elections is really try to examine what we, you know, what things we can do better, how we can make things better, how we can help people use our tools and products to really move the needle when it comes to elections. We're in a unique position, actually, that we're, you know, we're a company that now, with the, the acquisition of NBC by Comcast, we have broadcast, we have cable, we have online, we have on demand, we have, uh, you know, RFI, which is request for information. We also have a lot of buzzwords that you've been hearing the last few days, like set-top box, addressability, the, uh, the, the, the big A word that we never like to talk about. Um, but really, you know, so much going on in today's media landscape that it's hard to really, um, you know, I think there's a movement within the community to identify better ways to actually reach voters and, and really change out of the way things we were doing, like we were discussing this morning with, with the media buying panel. And that was when the APC actually came up to us and, and said, would you like to sponsor? That was part of our thought process, is really discuss this on a national level, how things are changing with media and how things are going to go and move into the future. Because as, as we all know, coming out of 2012, I mean, there was, there was a lot of talk of big data being merged and, and new technologies. Um, so things are really evolving and changing. And, it, and we want to stop and take a look at that and see what the future holds. So, 
With that said, enough, enough of me, uh, I would like to introduce our, our great panel. And I'm going to start um, first with uh, someone that needs no introduction, Jim Margolis, who is a partner at GMMB. Uh, Jim works at the intersection of politics, advertising, and advocacy um, on behalf of candidates, foundations, government agencies, and corporate clients. Uh, he has served uh, as a senior advisor with, uh, with uh, the President of the United States, Barack Obama, for his re-election campaign, and currently represents more Democratic centers than any consultant in the nation, including the majority leader, Harry Reid. Uh, next on our panel is Johanna Burgo. Hi, Johanna. How are you? Um, Joanna joined On Message Media immediately after helping Republicans keep the second largest majority in the House since World War II in 2012. She brings to the firm well-rounded talent, deeply rooted in communications and political strategy. She amassed nearly a decade of experience in a variety of positions in both executive and legislative branches on the presidential and congressional campaigns. Uh, thirdly, uh, Greg Donato. Greg, how are you? Okay, man. Greg is uh, a partner and chief operating officer of Deutsch New York, and is not only the heart and soul and fearless leader of the integrated creative team, he is what you'd call a marketer's creative director, concerned with strategy and problem solving for clients above all else. And finally on the uh, panel, we have uh, Elizabeth Wilner with Cantar Media. Are you Elizabeth? Uh, Elizabeth is Vice President of Cantar Media CMAG, which tracks and analyzes broadcast TV advertising content placement and spend. And finally, to moderate this panel much better than I would, um, I think someone that needs no introduction, we are very grateful and happy that he could take the time out of his busy schedule to join us, Mr. Chuck Todd. Good. So you're stuck with us as your lunch entertainment. So, you know, apologies, this is right. We all know this is how DC does entertainment. <laughs> Listen to a bunch of people pontificate. Uh, but we're hoping to sort of go through what we think is, what these folks think is the future of advertising. I don't want to call it television advertising. I think we all know that's obsolete. Um, but the question is, how obsolete? What does it mean? Uh, and we want to go forward from there. We're going to leave some time for questions. I promise you that. Uh, but I want to start with uh, the man who produced probably more television ads in the last, uh, political television ads in the last year, uh, Mr. Margolis, and ask you this. If we look back on 2012, will this be, what will it be the year as far as your concern, what will it be noted as when it comes to, to what, uh, what advanced in television advertising? Is this when you, for instance, perfected cable ad buying? Hmm. Uh, well, I should probably first correct you. Uh, Chuck, in that we had a pretty big team of people producing a lot of ads, and probably a lot of them are here today. Uh, in terms How of many ads. ads did you produce? This to me is, I think, the most fascinating ad. How many ads? Uh, I bet that in terms of ads that were produced both, um, you know, for air that actually got there, but including the ones that never saw the light of day, I bet there are 500 ads. And what produced. did you produce in 08? Uh, you know, probably 350. I mean, it's that level. Look, we, we didn't put anything on the air that wasn't tested. Um, and we probably, through that process, had four or five ads to everyone that, that actually got up. So, you know, there was a pretty big curve there. Um, I, I think the big difference, let me start with this. Yeah, I, I think what hasn't changed between 08 and 12 is, um, you know, the things that are most important is having a message that works and having a candidate who can deliver it. And, it, and I think uh, we have to be careful when we all come together that sort of the shiny new objects of analytics, data, all the things that were awesome and that we were able to do, I think, in new ways and that were really important. We'll talk about a lot of that today, I'm sure, in terms of addressability and, and some of the other kinds of things that are happening. It still matters sort of that you have that message and that you have a messenger uh, and a candidate who's offering some sort of vision and a, a direction for the country. That was the most important. I, I, I think, though, that if 08 was a period where in the campaign we tried new things like on demand and movie theaters and it was different places that we went to advertise, 
Uh, this year, it was, it was the use of data, the richness of data. Uh, I hope we get a chance to sort of talk about that in more detail. We got a lot of people up here. Um, but how that was brought in a meaningful way to um, really change how we both produced advertising, the number of tracks of advertising that we had, the ability to segment audiences in ways that we hadn't done before, and probably most importantly, to sort of begin to split up and look on the basis of individual voters, how we would communicate with them. So Johanna, does that mean ad buying is almost as, uh, as important, if not a more important art form for the media consultant these days as it is to actually making the product? Um, it is probably as, as, as equal. Um, I think, um, you know, in, in 2012, I was the NRCCIE director, so we had a $65 million operation. We did about 220 ads. Um, of course, there were a dozen media vendors who were helping us on that. Um, but I think in addition to the message, which is something we always do worry about, clearly, you know, you're running like 60 races at the same time, so your message in each race is important. This year, we did spend a lot more time on the buying aspect, and were we getting the right people at the right time? How many of our people um, were watching TV? How many of them were on their cell phones? Like, where were they on the cell phones? On home, at home, or at work? And um, so we did spend a lot of more time kind of trying to figure out how you get to them and how you get their attention. Um, they're watching TV with a laptop and or you know an iPhone in front of them. Um, so we, we, we were definitely trying to get the one place, two places, three places in one day. You know, Greg, what strikes me, and I always like having a non-political person when we talk about advertising, because usually the one thing non-political folks uh, have to say about political advertising is how uncreative it can seem sometimes. Do you still, are you one of those that feels that way? I, I think that <clears throat> at the end of the day, it's, you're trying to move a product, and so, Creativity for the sake of creativity, I think, is, is kind of BS anyway. I think that you have to always be enslaved to some kind of imperative to move a product. In this case, that's a candidate. So I, I, I would only factor creativity into it. If it persuades or if it generates preference, that's, what, that's the goal. I think creativity in the purest form is, is not, if that, if that happens and that's part of the persuasion process, that's great, but it should be about arming um, the social networks, arming the individual with a rationale that makes sense and with, with something that they can take away and go, okay, uh, I know what to do with this. I know how, how, where you guys are directing me and how, to change, how you're trying to change my mind. So Elizabeth, you, had the, you were in a perch where you were watching where they bought advertising, how they bought advertising, and, and this or that. And it was to, one of the stories tactically was the radical difference between the ad buying abilities of the Obama campaign versus the Romney campaign. Explain. Well, they were both our clients. Um, <laughs> so I should say that straight up. I think the Obama campaign basically internalized as much of the Democrat, overall Democratic buying operation as they could, whereas the Romney campaign was basically outsourcing a majority of the Republican advertising on his behalf. Um, and so the Romney campaign focused you know, on battleground states in traditional battleground markets, traditional programming for Republican candidates. And the Obama campaign, you know, Jim was being humble, I think the Obama campaign had about 20 different spots on the air at any given time over the summer and the fall, which I think was an astonishing number. Um, and again, speaks to how centralized that whole effort was. So. The Obama campaign was basically Jerry Bissell and controlled the vast majority of the message on his behalf, and Romney was in this much more diffuse situation where he was very dependent on the outside groups who were spending actually more money than he was able to spend on, on his own advertising. Well, and, and I'm curious, and, and Johanna, do you have a success that you would point to where there was a TV ad that you never aired on television but was incredibly successful on social media and then got enough attention where it feels as if it penetrated the way a TV ad did? Hmm. Um, I don't know that I have a specific example um, of one ad that wasn't on TV and was, but I will say we did have a lot of ads that we made specifically for television. I, I mean, specifically for digital. So, you know, if there was um, 
like the baseball playoffs were going on and um, college football was starting. So in certain areas, uh, we made ads that were specific to that and tried to get them on more sports sites. Um, so, and I do think that some of that got through. We, we did start asking in our polls, um, and you would hear in some of the verbatims, the people that we were targeting on, let's say, this, say the sports, mentioned something sports related. So, you know, we go in and assume that they saw that online. Right. Um, I mean, we've seen plenty of studies that if someone watches an ad on TV and then sees, you know, the same ad or a complimentary ad on um, online, the message recall, the brand recalls is so much higher. How did you guys use online? It seems like sometimes you, you did make ads only for social media. Yep. And sometimes you used it as a, 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 a real life focus group. The way normally old school focus, just to see what would penetrate, explain. Uh, well, you, you know, back to, I think points have been made a couple of different ways. I mean, today 70% of the public is looking at multiple screens every day. So having you know, an integrated campaign and, and paid advertising approach is pretty important. You've got hundreds of millions of people in this country who are sitting there with a laptop and sitting there online and watching television and using their smartphone. So part of the process here has been how do you begin to, you know, both target and segment audiences and use those tools where they are, when they are. So when you're sitting there with that with that tablet while you're watching television at night being able to feed complimentary information that might be in a static banner ad or in uh, content related advertising uh, and we did that but on the on the you know on the effort to also generate interest from folks like you right um, it was often one of the channels that we used a lot to sort of get an ad out put it online there was a lot of use of the same advertising when we were really trying to push through in terms of persuasion or get out the vote. Mm -hmm. uh, but this was a forum for us to really move into the, into the news stream an awful lot of the time. And I think that's true, not just in presidential. People are doing that all the time in congressional and Senate right. races and down ballot. Hey, Greg, who's doing a better job right now? Political consultants and trying to figure out how to talk to folks both in social media and on television? Or is corporate America figuring this out yet? Uh, it's a different game. I think both are actually doing a really good job. The, the interesting thing will be to see what happens when the two parties start to really gain parity in this world. And a certain degree of virtuosity and analytics and in, and in really hyper-targeting, nano-targeting, nano uh, and, and really specific messaging to individuals. Once that starts to be a little bit more commoditized, then I think the world is going to be really, it's going to, we're going to see how are we deploying against the social networks and allowing the social networks to kind of, you know, that's the wild west. You have to create really great content to put out there on behalf of your, of your candidate and to let people be the ones who are going to tuck it under their arm. And hope it's viral and hope they're it pushing be, the message. Yeah. So once we really start to gain parity and analytics and, and targeting and all that stuff, you're going to see people are going to go, oh my gosh, what we really need to do now is to create stuff that is more compelling uh, and that really lets our social networks work for us more, I, work, work hard. I, if I can just follow up, I mean, I, look, you know, people aren't just consuming content anymore. They're creating it, they're sharing it, they're influencing others with it. And so finding these ways to be able to have advertising that pushes people to move it to others. You know, I, I think through uh, Facebook and Facebook contacts, you know, for, for a medium that is John Kerry's race in 2004, um, you, you know, where Facebook then exists to a place where it's the third largest country in the world if you added them all up. Okay. Uh, you know, to have now. The way Mark Zuckerberg would like to have it. Uh, there you <laughs> go. Referred to, yeah. We, you know, we had, I think, thir 34 million uh, followers. Mm -hmm. And those 34 million followers of Barack Obama were in touch with 90% of the electorate. And to begin to think about how they were used within this campaign to communicate and influence others was really, really important and, and a big part of it. 24 million Twitter followers. Jo Joanna or Jim, did either one of you in, 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 in use any uh, user-generated content? Yeah, on specific, um, more like 
advocacy campaigns and such like that. Um, I mean, the committees will do it a lot too, where they ask people, you know, to send videos. You kind of compile it. Um, but we, we've done that for some non-candidate was, was Have you used any that's been effective? Did you use any user-generated oh, TV yeah, ads or, yeah. or oh, web I mean, videos? For, first of all, you're going to be so proud. I studied up on like three statistics, so I signed all the statistics. <laughs> so here I go. Um, all right. So I think we had something like 130 million YouTube views okay. of our content. Right. Then you think about within the Obama campaign of all the stuff that's getting produced from the music videos to individual, uh, you know, and there were contests and all sorts of stuff that would come into us that then get repurposed and pushed out. But, but at least as meaningful as what we did in those 130 million views of our material was what people were doing with each other. And that was, that was the powerful stuff. You know, Elizabeth, one of the challenges that I thought was was I was always curious about, and, and I'm wondering if you could, sh if you have any examples to sort of show this is how, and particularly this goes to what Joanna was trying to do, is how did they, how did people not running for president advertise? Did they do anything unique or different to try to stand out because they were worried they were getting drowned in the airwaves? I have to say that my office mates thought I was totally strange. I looked at every single ad that came through CMAG. Of course you did. Yeah, uh, thousands of ads. And the answer to your question, the short answer is really no. No one did no one figured anything out. unusual. I mean, we're sitting here talking about how television ads can't exist in a silo anymore. They have to be inspiring a conversation or reflecting a conversation. And I could count on one hand the number of ads I saw that included a Twitter hashtag or you know a Facebook page or anything else that encouraged people to go online. Maybe they went online anyway, and certainly in the presidential race, they did. But I think that down ballot races, the television advertising has quite a ways to go to sort of achieve that you know, level of conversation back in the district. And then you know, creating the metrics to measure that conversation, and see how your ads are impacting your voters is really important. And I think what, you know, the midterms will be a really interesting way to see whether a lot of the tactics that were used the presidential race are, are going to be more widespread. So what's the, um, so that sort of brings me to the DVR issue. Um, I know you guys spent a lot of time studying how people watch television. Um, is it just trying to figure out, you tar are we going to be the point you target, tele you target advertising to people that don't know how to use the fast forward on their machine? <laughs> or uh, what, what, is the, what is the impact of DVR? What was it on... How did, what decisions did you make based on DVR that changed the way you bought advertising? Um, let me try it this way. I mean, first of all, video is video is video, I think. Say it again. Video is video is video. So if I'm serving to you on your tablet or on your phone or online or on television, all of those things are relevant. And I think the thing that's changed is we used to buy everything kind of on the basis of programming, right? Now we're looking much more for audiences. How do we get who we want to get, where they live, where they are, where they communicate. And so uh, a lot of the work that, that we did this last time was to try to figure out from a communication standpoint to more narrowly get folks. Okay, so have, have, I don't know whether over the course of the last couple of days people, for example, have talked about rent track and some of the, the kind of data work that we did to... Hey, let me stop there. Because rent track, I feel like, explain what rent track does. All right. Do not fear this yet. Um, it's big so, brother on steroids, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm just going to bias it right now. Okay. Go ahead. So set top box uh, for Dish and Satellite coming soon <coughs> to Comcast probably and everybody else. You, you should jump in, guys, where you get there. Is measuring second by second everything you're doing on your television. So what you're watching, when you change the channel, and so on. And the campaign through the analytics operation and through the people that we have on our buying side, putting in all the data, looking at past information about your voter history, what happened at the door knock, what happened when we talked to you on the phone. All of that data is getting aggregated, how you're registered, and put into the database. Then we're taking the rent track data of individual households, people, and matching that with all that information we have on whether you're a persuadable voter 
whether you're a get out the vote target or whether we want to put a do not disturb sign on you because you're Republican and we don't want to, you know, make you too aware of all the things that are happening around you. You merge that data so that we actually know what, don't panic, I'm going to not, not have you too worried, Chuck, what Chuck Todd is watching at 3 o'clock in the morning, except... Oh, I'm online. <laughs> except... And tweeting. And tweeting about what he's watching. Yeah. We actually don't know what Chuck Todd's doing because we do a privacy screen. Okay. But we know exactly what people like Chuck Todd, who have that same profile. They're Democrats, they're, you know, persuadable voters, however. Don't they throw the Democrats thing at me. I got a hard enough time. Uh, <laughs> Republicans, yeah. very conservative, you know. But, but now we're looking at exactly what is, what is it that that target is watching. And that's what allowed us to say, uh-oh, we're missing out here on going onto TV land and buying Gomer Pyle reruns because we've got a certain very efficient but small group of people that are our targets. And they're listening to and watching at that time, and we're now able to go find them. And so yeah, that's a long way around to like DVR. It's just we so got to know go. if they fast forward or not. We know. You know that? We know on those TV sets where we can go do it. And we know whether they're watching the ads, and we know the ads they aren't watching, and where they're going fast forward. Um, and that's where the future is. And I think the other part of the future, and I, let me yeah. kick it to somebody else, no. is, is the addressability issue. And that, that's, you know, the announcement here, which I don't think we've ever talked about before, is we actually did it. We actually were addressing in individual systems this last time whether people identifying a house on whether they were a persuasion target, a GOTV target, or a do not disturb target, and sending different ads for a small portion, because it it's just starting, of, uh, at the exact same show, moving into this house on this street, one ad that's focused on persuasion, and next door, an ad that's focused in the exact same program at the exact same time, delivering to that house uh, a GOTV spot. Greg, how important is this to the industry, the ability, I mean, does the television, is the television industry, is, are my bosses ready for this to be able to, um, basically my two neighbors, uh, get different advertising on the same show as I would? Yes. The difference is, and uh, I'll defer to a conversation I was having with Elizabeth before, which is, as you pointed out, this is a zero-sum game. So building the front end that allows for that kind of addressability is an expense that really makes sense in a zero-sum game. It's still more efficient for us to not build as robust a front end an our media decision-making machine and say instead, look, we can buy with real efficiency in, in, a very, in a very evolved way. We can still buy broadcast media in that way and complement it with other targeted stuff. Eventually, we will need to, for higher stakes purchases, higher stakes decisions, build those front ends and start to like really get down to like buying individual, sending individual messages to individual. Did you pick up on this? Did you start seeing this <clears throat> as you were monitoring? Well, uh, to, to refer back to what I was saying before, we saw that the Obama campaign had 20 different creatives on the air at any one time. I think some of those creatives were get out the vote, some were aimed at persuadables, and some were aimed at, at suppressing the vote. Um, some only aired in a few markets, some aired in almost every market that was seeing presidential advertising. So I think that gets to what, what we're talking about here. So what I want to know is, so then, as an, if you're an early voter, then can I then turn off the TV ad switch, right? Am I going to be able to do that too? I mean, I mean no, in all honesty, are you going to, is this technology going to get to the point where actually, once you find out somebody voted, then you don't have to send advertising to them anymore? Uh, it can get to that place. The only thing you want to make sure you don't do now is buy advertising between 9 and 10 on MSNBC. That is a very, sinkhole. I'm very concerned about that. I, very I, 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 want to add to, I want to add to that because once you've identified that person, right, yeah. and okay, we've convinced this person, it's, it's inefficient for us to kind of mess against, mess, message against them would be, would be wrong. Actually, what you need to do is to arm them with the stuff that they can now propel out into their networks 
to help spread the word. So you, you, know, that, you, you don't switch off that high value persuaded person. I think you'd redeploy them. Joanna, we've, uh, obviously there's a lot of people, a lot of the, the tech geeks have been uh, going nuts and, and complimenting the Obama campaign. <laughs> Is the Republican Party as far behind as we all think they are on this front? Uh, we have a lot of work to do. I think um, it d definitely ranges. Um, I mean, Jim has competitors. We have competitors. I think everyone does things a little different. I, I, I do think there are good stories of, of things that Republicans have done. Um, you know, we did a, do a couple of creative stuff in 12. Um, I wasn't involved in the Romney campaign, so I, I can't speak for them specifically. Uh, you know, on the congressional side, we had a lot of races in very expensive markets. We had um, three races alone in the Chicago market, which is astronomical right. cost. Um, so in places like that, knowing we have a limited budget, there were certain things we had to do, so we had to find people in a different way. Um, so we started actually tagging their phones. If you slept two nights in a certain zip code, we know what congressional district you're in, so we have three different congressional districts that we're tagging. When you're at, you're at work in Chicago, I don't have to advertise to you while you're at work and watching MSN or whatever it is because I know what phone you're using, so I'll advertise to you on your phone instead. So um, I think there are a lot of good things we're doing. I think everyone has a lot of work to do and clearly Republicans do as well. What's gonna be the, so in, 20, in 2012, there was, a majority of the money was still spent on television versus digital. In 2016, in tw what's the split going to be between now you said don't think of it as videos on one, but what do, what do we think the split's going to be trend-wise, Elizabeth? Start start this. We've seen what 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 if you base it on what 04 was to 08 and 08 was to 12. Where are we headed on the split between television and digital? Well, just television and digital. I, I would describe digital in terms of radio. So I think TV still accounts for the majority of the ad spend. Digital probably is closer to being a parody with radio. Maybe it passes radio. They're roughly two and three. Uh, because you can think of digital as another visual medium, you know, like television, right. because you use digital to drive people to watching video of candidates, video that you want them to see. So it's basically a second visual medium. Where, what, was, what was your percentage of digital to, to television? Uh, I mean, it's still small. In relative terms, TV is going to be still under ten percent of yeah. your budget. Mm -hmm. Close what? to, close to ten. But uh, listen, I mean, I think it is going to continue to change. It's going to continue to evolve. I, I mean, I agree that uh, I don't want to give the impression today that everything is going to things like addressable local market. There's we we actually did network buys, much bigger network buys than the Romney people did because we computed efficiency to buy within all of the battleground states and continually looked at that uh, to figure out where was our break point where it was better for us to actually buy network. I'm sorry, it's funny you say that, because what was it? 88 was the last year there was network television ad buys until 2008. That's correct. You guys made the, the it was we, it gone we 20 years without a network. And, and we Trust made, us, we know this at NBC. Um, <laughs> we missed the network advice. Yeah, no, and, and you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, do have, you do have the Olympics, you know. <laughs> we do have the Olympics, and that was right. Yeah, right. yeah that helps. Uh, you know, so there were, there were points. At, let me give you a couple of examples, because all of you guys are feeling this that, that are, that are in, in our business. If you went into the local markets, we found that just given that clutter, that was taking place, particularly in news, where you know you could be seeing six, seven spots in a row in a pod, right? Mm -hmm. That if if we were going into the network pod instead of the local, we were standing alone, and we were very, very close on the dollar amount. By the time you added the you know nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen battleground states buying those individual markets, that for a certain percentage of our buy, it was efficient to actually buy network. That's a lot of eyeballs. But it was also still based on demographic targeting, still going and looking at you know, which shows were gonna deliver for us the best. So I don't wanna give the impression that everything here is, is going to the direction that you know, it's gonna be an individual person in an individual house that you've already screened four different ways. That's not you know, gonna be the total picture, it's just changing, it's just evolving.
Greg, what is, Greg, tell me in corporate uh, America, what is the split right now? Well, it varies by category, but what's happening is, and this is really interesting, you ask the question as if we're dealing with paid media only. And I think more and more the split has got to be we have to start putting money into the earned media sphere and evolving our ability to kind of watch the proliferation of the conversation through social networks because that is really where the future is going to be. It's not going to be about how, mu how many banner ads that I buy, you know, how many, how many takeovers. That, that's not going to be as persuasive ultimately as, as arming, arming your folks, your advocates, with preference generating messaging, materials, and content. And so the split on budget should not be in and amongst paid media, but we need to devote more stuff to, to, to earn. Joanna, what was the biggest waste of money in television? The biggest waste of what's money? Been the, what's the biggest waste of money that you still stuck doing in TV ad buying? Hmm. Um, I like to say is having to buy really expensive markets like Chicago when you've got three <laughs> congressional races, but um, in, in one place. Um, but I think, um, I think it's when you do 100% on television and you don't do a little bit of everything, or 100% on broadcast, 100% on cable. Um, I think if you look into it a little bit more, try to find out where your voter is, try to find out what, what they're watching, where they are watching it from, um, I think that is probably the most efficient way of doing it. Um, I mean, I think right now most budgets, close to 80% of the budget goes on, on, on television. Um, you know, of, of our $65 million budget last cycle, we used about 8% on digital. That's not really fair to look at it overall because there were races where it was 1%. There were races that were... Is digital more than mail now? Um, mail is more expensive, so no. But, is that, um, but you by think impression... That you think that changes by 2016? Um, I think... I think it depends who you're going after. I mean, I think with a lot of the things that we're, that we're talking about, I think we have to remember sometimes, you know, we are trying to get the opposite kind of person. So sometimes their buy should not look like ours because we're looking for, you know, there are times you're trying to get the persuadable, there's times you're, you know, to get out the vote message, you're trying to get the opposite sort of person. So, um, like, radio still works very well for Republicans, you know, not so much for Democrats. So I think there are certain mediums that you may see one party still doing, one party not doing, and that's because well, I've heard at this, time even they're going against the opposite. Republicans are still more likely to buy news adjacencies. There are more Republican ads on news adjacencies. You guys are more likely to buy daytime television. Is that fair? Yeah, but for a couple of reasons. I mean, look, um, again, I think that clutter in news was, was a huge, huge problem. And I, I just, I mean, I don't, I don't know about you all, but I can't watch it. Right. And I, I think that the idea that because somebody has told you that those, you know, early on, high information, they're there, or persuadables, we're looking very, very carefully at who those targets are and trying to get as much information as we possibly can about what they're, you know, tuning into and going there. And I think that the task is to go more places. If you looked at Governor Romney and you looked at, at the president, I think we were on something, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, but I, I think we were on like 40 different cable channels, heavily into cable early. Right. And they were more like into eight or nine, you know, ESPN and Fox and, you know. After Labor Day. After Labor Day. And they and, were buying channels, you were buying shows. Right. Isn't that, is, I mean, that sort of, is that, is that the fair way to look at it? Like, could you tell that, that they were, yes, it was on 40 cable channels, but they seemed to target specific shows? Well, I would ask the folks who are sponsoring this panel. Uh, we actually don't track local cable ourselves, mm -hmm. but we know that the Obama campaign was on local cable basically for six months, which is what you need to really have your ads burn in. If you're only going to be on local cable for a month and a half, you know, I'm, I'm sure local, the local cable folks appreciated it, Comcast appreciated it, but at the end of the we day... We love what, cable advertising what, now. What did the Romney <laughs> campaign get for that? You know, arguably, it was kind of not enough to help them. Um, biggest waste of money. I made Joanna do it, so I'm going to mm -hmm. make you do it. What's your frustrating part? It, this necessary money you're spending in television that you feel like should change. Uh, you know, well, maybe it's us well I think industry. I hit it with, with Other what than I just my show. said. I understand that. No. <laughs> no, no, you, well, yeah. no, in addition to 9 to 10 a.m. Right, right, right. on MSNBC. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I really do feel that when people are just going out there and 
you know, buying the programming and particularly the news because they think that works and you find yourself crowded in. And, and the other thing is, look, you know, I mean, the creative has to work and, and um, really your point uh, that that's the most important thing you do. You know, you brought up something and I'm, I'm going to, Greg, I want you to start this part of the conversation, which was the 2008 was known as let's find new cool places to advertise. So you brought up movie theaters, Jim. I remember video games. That was going to be the next great product placement in video games. That's happening a lot in corporate America. It didn't really take off in the political world. Uh, I think that there is, and this gets back even to the adjacency question. You know, when I'm when I'm selling beer, it makes sense to be in sports because I feel good about what I'm doing, and it's not work, right? The adjacent, the news adjacency is like, yes. I guess I'm, I'm in a mindset where it makes sense for me to be thinking about these issues, but I don't want to exhaust the view. And I don't want to intrude, constantly intrude. I'm so sorry. Oh. And I don't want to constantly oh, intrude. Oh my God. Now you're intruding. <laughs> now I'm intruding. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't want to constantly intrude. And I think that there is this, this Orwellian thing that's starting to happen where Oh my God, you don't, you, not only are you reaching me with precisely the right message, the implication of which is that you are reading my, my set-top box and my mail and everything else, but now you're showing up on my cell phone at this very particular moment with a game. You know, it, it's, it, it starts to become a, a little bit intrusive, and I think that especially with politics, high-stakes game, a little exhausting, you're asking me to change my, my mind, I think it makes sense actually to back off and look at different moments and, and different media that aren't so um, intrusive and exhausting. Maybe that's a good point. Anybody here have an idea of what, the, what, what they think the new cool thing will be that, that might be worth experimenting? I mean, you know, so, so how do you advertise on Netflix, Joanna? I guess would be my question to you. Hmm. Um, I'm not a buyer, so I don't know 100% <laughs> um, how do you Do you want to figure that out as an advertiser? Do you want to figure out how to do that? I mean, we want to f figure out how to advertise anywhere. Unfortunately, um, because we are political ads and not, you know, a product ad, people are not as Nobody wants your open yeah. to our advertising. So we do need that disruptive media. So um, that's why we use a lot show of... TV show wouldn't mind if Miller Lite presented you know, the Game right. of Thrones. Right, but we Maybe need to be NRCC disruptive. Right, right, right. <laughs> we need to kind of force people to watch it. So if you have to watch our 30 second or you have to watch our 60 in order to watch what you want to watch, that's where we want to be. Um, unfortunately, we, we do need it but to be a little bit low, disruptive. But, but there are low drag places. It's interesting you talked about Gomer Pyle reruns. I feel less intruded upon watching Gomer Pyle at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> than I do when I'm going to buy a particular favorite of mine on Netflix. That's an active choice to be entertained in a way very specific as opposed to, oh, God put Gomer Pyle on at 2 a.m. That's cool, let me watch that. Oh, you, you're, that's something interesting that you're trying to get me to do. It, it's, it's just a different dynamic. So you have to be yeah. careful about you know, stepping on people's toes in those moments. Did, did you have any, uh, did any of your Hulu advertising, did you feel like the Hulu advertising or stuff like that was effective? Yeah, was, yeah. I mean, look, we, we're all over it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the task now. Is, and it's, again, this isn't just presidential, right? I mean, in most, there are only presidentials come around for every four years and there's a lot of other races in between. Uh, people are tuning in to uh, get their content lots of different places. And you need to meet them where they're going. And that's one of the places that we spend a lot of time and energy. Mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth, um, before we're gonna start questions here in a minute for the audience. Um, was there a, a unique, you said the creativity wasn't there, but was there a unique place that you saw ads show up that you thought, oh, that's an interesting experiment? A unique place that we saw ads show up? Uh, no, because again, we're looking really at television, so if you're talking about programming, I think Jim's addressed some of the places where they've been advertising Hulu. I actually want to address the question you asked earlier, which was, you know, biggest waste of money. And I think most of the people in this room understand this by now, but the idea that it's better to lay down late, lay down your money late, because you don't want to tip anybody off about where you're advertising, you know, as long as there are outside groups out there who want to help your campaign win, 
there's no reason to lay money down late unless it's that you haven't raised it yet. So the waste comes in, you know, the Obama campaign did this very well, and I know we're talking a lot about what they did well and what Republicans didn't, but the fact is that the Obama campaign laid down their money early, and as a result, they got better rates, they got more bang for their buck, and the waste on the Republican side came in from money that was put down late, either because the groups didn't know where the governor was going to advertise because the governor's campaign wasn't putting their money down early, and the governor's campaign was waiting until the week before, in a lot of cases, to, to put down money on their advertising. There's just, if you don't have to do that anymore, there's no reason to do it. The whole idea that stealth advertising and not tipping your hand, everyone knows where you're putting your money. Like, everyone's gonna find out before your ad airs that your ad is going to air. The last surprise I think you can have in advertising is what your ad is going to say. And in a lot of cases, you don't even want that to be a surprise anymore because you want to get the earned media off the, off the content of the ad. But I think that the waste comes in when you place, uh, and not necessarily so much on any particular channel. Or channel program. or whether the, the local TV affiliate has doubled their prices, right? shrunk their news hole from 22 minutes to 20 minutes to sell an extra two minutes to sell of ads. As many a TV affiliate has done that right. uh, over and the years. And you'll make stations very happy when you do that because then they'll be able to make their non-political advertisers happy. So it's win-win for everybody. Greg, what is, do you look at this and say, what, what did you, when you were watching this, what seemed like the biggest waste of money to you? Everything. <laughs> no. I, I think, you know, I, I look at political advertising a little bit differently than, than the other stuff. I mean, it, it was, I, I almost wanted to revise my answer to the question before when you said, hey, you know, does the dearth of creativity in there, uh, is, is, does it really matter? And, and, it, and it really does. And it, but not creativity, c the dearth of compellingness. So I, to me, the biggest waste of money is content that is just filling channels and filling moments. So I see a lot of stuff that's quick turnaround, but is poorly crafted, and you have a very sophisticated um, audience that's trying to ingest this messaging, and sometimes it's, it's done in an incompetent way and that tends to uh, diminish its value and its, 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 its ability to leverage opinion. Um, that said, I also see a lot of stuff, fast turnaround stuff, and, and that it is done tightly and I recognize like this is just meant to be a shot that comes out really quickly um, in, the, in the campaigns that are better funded, uh, the presidential campaigns, but in, the, in, in a lot of the local stuff, it, it's, it's, it looks really hacky and bad. And, and Elizabeth, since we're all talking about wasted money, everybody feels saturated, put a little bit of perspective here. Political advertising accounted, was it any greater than any other industry in 2012? Well, and, and Greg can speak to this too. I mean, we all think that a billion dollars in presidential advertising on TV is a lot, and it is, but you know, the insurance industry spends that or more, automakers spend that or more. I think, you know, to get back to Greg's point, it's the political advertising that people Notice, you know, at the end of the day, you don't hear someone going home and say, or you don't see someone turn off their TV at night and say, oh, I'm going to throw myself out the window if I see one more car ad. You know, but they say that about political because, because the ads generally are not funny or sexy or incredibly creative or, you know, stand out. They're just, their whole point is to drive home a single message about the candidate or the candidate's opponent. And there isn't an enormous amount of, no offense, there isn't an enormous amount of creativity that necessarily... No, I mean, yeah. do you feel, I mean, no, uh, look, I, I just, <laughs> you're coming into our house. Yeah, you know. <laughs> All right, you had <laughs> the American Association of <laughs> Political Consultants. And, and what was it? Talk about, talk about Your most those. creative ad was, what, Mitt Romney singing? <laughs> but, uh, but actually, yeah. that ad, because it stood out because it was different, because even if you weren't watching your television, if you were in the other room and you heard Mitt Romney singing, you paid attention to the yes. spot. So an ad where there's no audio whatsoever, if no one's in the room to watch it, it's, you know, yeah. talk about wasted money. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna ag agree a little bit um, on that. I mean, I was trying to push so much. It, at the end, yes, you need to get your message through, but at the end when there's just so much advertising, you need to break through. So, our focus in, you know, I mean, as early as September, actually, because there were so many stations that were just so booked, but um, was just the ability to break through and the ability to be creative, to be simple. I mean, people are so cynical in those last couple months. So you need to get, 
yes, it has to be a negative ad, but it has to be a different sort of negative ad that, you know, it doesn't look like you're literally just punching the guy because people are so sick of, of seeing that. Um, so the ability to break through is also, I mean, we've been talking so much about buying, but it's so important to talk about how the messages have to change and, you know, the quality of the ad has to change um, because people are changing and you are kind of annoying them by I had being no everywhere. Idea. I just never understood how the poor local campaign official who was stuck running for re-election in a presidential year in a presidential battleground state. I don't know how they did it. Well, it, it, if you look, I, I mean, for those of you who sort of understand the whole gross rating point kind of thing, um, if you lived in Cleveland or if you lived in, you know, any of the key battleground states, we were in those last couple of weeks, the combined, this is just presidential, Romney and allies together were running, in some instances, upwards of 6,500 to 7,000 gross rating points per week. And we were at 4,500. So you're, you're talking about levels that have never been seen before. And the real- In a concentrated area. In a concentrated yeah. area. And the real winners, it wasn't President Obama. No. It was the local TV the local stations. TV. Scripps Howard. Mm -hmm. They were increasingly. Yeah. We don't know. We don't have enough O and O's anymore. So what? We weren't the winners. Just so you know, network television wasn't the winners here. Hopefully, it was Comcast. That's what we're trying to do here. Let me open it up to some questions. How are we doing this? Where's the? Uh, where's the mic? There we go. We got a mic. So raise your hand. Uh, I can barely see. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, participating on this. I'm Neil Schwartz. I work for Arbitron, and uh, one of the things that uh, was just mentioned is how you turn on, you basically don't look at the video, but you recognize the sound. And my question to you, uh, and, and I think this could solve a lot of the repetitive uh, over uh, exposure to the clutter uh, in a presidential campaign, or any campaign for that matter, where there's too many TV spots, is maybe consider radio. Radio has 22% of the, the Americans, uh, 283 million Americans a week listen to radio. They spend 22% of their day uh, using all media with radio, but radio only gets about 4% of the, the money. What happened to radio? Where did radio go wrong? That's my question. Jim, how much radio did you guys spend? You know, I don't know the numbers, um, and I don't know that we have anybody from my shop here. I mean, Less we than still... 4%. What's that? Less than 4%. For, for Obama? Correct. About less than 4%. <laughs> <laughs> was all your radio, though, was all your radio get out the vote? Was all your radio get, no, get out wasn't. the vote, African American radio? It, it wasn't. We also, and this won't help, I'm afraid, uh, my friend from Arbitron, but we, we also uh, pay a lot of attention to those ratings. And let me also say Nielsen and also <laughs> in the audience here. Um, but we, we also went, you know, to Pandora, and we're going to other places that people are also getting, you know, that are, that are not television, that are either for music or for other kind of information. Um, and so there was a significant amount. It wasn't all get out the vote. It was, uh, you know, persuasion as well. Um, but, but I, I was just going to say, what part of radio, jo Joanna, is any part of radio persuasion in a general election for Republicans? In a primary it is, but in a general election? Yeah, we used it, for example, I mean, this is so specific, but we used it in a certain district in Minnesota. There was um, a small market that was really pro-gun, and we had a liberal Democrat that was bad on guns. And we probably weren't going to put a pro-gun message on television, but we went ahead and put it on, on, on radio and targeted it. There were places where we would target women, um, where we had, like, a specific women message. Um, but, I mean, about... I think ten times more Republicans listen to radio than than than, than Democrats. But so is radio going to be I would say is radio going to be a growth, growing, or a shrinking part of the media budget in two years? We are going also to Pandora and iHeartRadio, so I think maybe it, we will spread between, you know, the radio and online radio. Great. Does radio need to sort of do the radio industry need to figure out how to better make itself an advertising vehicle? Um, we use radio as a, as a reminder medium, as a reinforcement medium, as a retail medium, not as a kind of downstream, we want you to make this kind of a decision. As you get closer to the moment of decision, radio is a good kind of 
push medium, and it's great with an existing audience for whom you want to encode a particular message. You're not, it's harder to do persuasion. You don't have sight, sound, and motion. So um, if they use it correctly, uh, I think that you can, if you decide to look at it from a communications architecture standpoint and say, I'm going to have certain messaging which happens towards the end of my cycle that is about reminder, push, go, make, do, that's where radio is most compelling. Let me go back to the audience. Sorry, it's blinding light. Let me get a mic. We got a mic over here. Uh, yeah. We'll get I'm, Bill, I'm Bill Hillswing from Northwoods Advertising. Speaking um, of creative. <laughs> thanks. Um, like you guys, I didn't... I can't recall any good ads from the last cycle, but Elizabeth, I think you mentioned something about voter suppression ads. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I think what I was talking about is that some of the ads that the Obama campaign had on the air, again, around 20 at any particular time, you know, some of them were clearly aimed at keeping people from feeling great about voting for Governor Romney as opposed to feeling great about voting for President Obama. Uh I, I just want to be clear, we were not running voter suppression ads. No, and I didn't, and the, the, We, we were certainly a... running ads that called into question what Governor Romney represented or some of his ideas, his agenda, what the choice was, but this was not to try to push down turnout, it was to try to lift up uh, people in terms of the choice that they were ultimately making. You so weren't trying, you weren't trying to, to make the Republican turnout lower? ever in any way were we trying to do so voter suppression. So you wanted Republican turnout higher? Sorry? You wanted higher Republican turnout? Uh, listen, we, we didn't communicate in all instances where the Republicans were. But we certainly weren't trying to push down their vote by using advertising. It, it's a loaded term, and, and I, I shouldn't have used it. But some ads were geared more toward focusing on Governor Romney and his not being the best choice. And other ads were focused more on getting out the vote for President Obama. What was your more effective advertising? Mm -hmm. You guys did a lot more negative ads. So in your creative than positive in the fall. That but we did, we did more positive than certainly the other side did. Uh, l let me just roll through a couple of statistics. Uh, it's true. This is true. It's true. Um, it's true. Oh, that's true. <laughs> we, did, we did in Obama $450 million worth of advertising. Allies did about 90. So let's call it 550 Obama and allies. Romney did about 225 million Romney and about 450 million allies. You get that difference? 450, 450, but it's allies, Obama, and about, you know, so we're all spent by a couple hundred million dollars in apples to apples if you add them all together, but a lot of it was ours. The difference was the incoming from all of those allies was 100% negative. For Romney, it was mostly negative. And for us, it would be about a third of our advertising was Obama positive and probably about two thirds either contrast or going after Romney. What's the difference? I've always loved this. What's the difference between a contrast ad and a, and a negative ad? <laughs> well, well, often the contrast would have an element that was about what we were doing. There would be a little bit of positive. That you it would be, positive. yeah, here's, you a choice. A little here's bit the choice. A choice hat. Okay. Question out here with a microphone. I know there's somebody up here, by the way, who's got a question, but no mic. Yes, sir. Hey, guys, I just have a question about saturation, but particularly how you measure. The first, just for, right, you can take four Tylenols. It's not going to help your headache any more than two. You can do a third set in the gym, not going to help you any more than one. You can throw a, a towel in the bathtub. I dispute I mean, the Tylenol remark. But that's yeah. <laughs> Sometimes by the fifth or sixth one, I'm kind of yeah. woozy. Yeah, it's kind of nice. but, but for some reason, we throw this out in politics. Look, look in my business, phones, the amount of money that is wasted on, say, robocalls at the end is, is appalling, but we do it. But, but, and, we, and we know, like Jim said, just in, in the D.C. market, when we were seeing it, a Kane, an Allen, a Romney, a Casino, and all. I thought it then, what if Kane just pulled all his ads off, at least of news adjacencies, would it have mattered? I don't, I don't know, but how do you, everyone knows there's too much. I mean, someone mentioned that people were turned off because of politics. Elizabeth, I think it was you, because the quality of the ads, they didn't have anything to do with it. It was the, the volume and the, the amount of them. But here's my question, but 
we know it's too much, but how do you measure it, right? Is, are there some tools out there so you can measure it, so you can say, we don't need to do, you know, putting another news adjacency on isn't going to make any difference at all. Right? Yeah. Joanna, you talked about that you guys were looking for creative to break through the saturation. Yeah. Any other ways that you guys try to deal with it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think it depends where you are. You, you might be lucky enough, I mean, like Jim was saying, Cleveland, yes, Cleveland had, I mean, every single race you could ever think of was, was open and competitive. So unfortunately, you will probably have to advertise a little bit more there so that people do see your, your, your ad a little bit more because um, you are going to lose more people and they're going to get stuck in, oh, it's just another a Senate ad, a congressional ad, a presidential ad. Um, you know, there are places where, you know, if your viewer is not watching every single station, you might be watching a lot because most, you know, they think that the person that they need to get out is, is you know, is all in one station. Um, but I mean, I think it would... Like I said before, I think if you do 100% in one place, it's never good. So I think um, putting a little bit on TV, a little bit on digital, a little bit on mobile, um, you know, obviously the person's getting mail, et cetera. Um, you know, some of the stuff that Jim has been talking about is really going to help here because we're not going to have to <laughs> advertise so, so, so much to try to get our 800, 1,000, 1,200, however many GRPs. Are you guys sensitive to right. the saturation issue? Absolutely. And we, how, did, what, we how, stopped. how did you measure it? We stopped. We, we got to a point where we decided in a lot of these battleground markets, enough was enough. And so we were moving to different channels, meaning mm -hmm. literally different channels, but also different mediums. And honestly, I mean, this is stuff that I've talked about with the Romney people when we did, you know, we do the post-election mm -hmm. get togethers between their leadership and ours. I mean, before I went to the 7,000th point, I would have gone to Michigan or I would have gone to Minnesota, or I would have gone to Pennsylvania earlier, I think, I think. You never know what's going on within a campaign. I think they did a lot of stuff really right, but that's one where you're sort of going 7,000 points. Now, one of the problems that they had, and again, I worry a little bit because we're, we're very presidential focused here today, but, but one of the problems that they had is they didn't control as much of the message as we did. Just what I said a minute ago. We had $450 million that we controlled every single dollar of that. Those poor guys and women had $225 million that they controlled and they were at the mercy of whatever yeah. any of the independent super PACs decided they were gonna put up for $450 million. That's a hard place to be. And we had that advantage in both 08 and 12 where we controlled our own message. And that's, that is a huge disadvantage that Stuart and everybody on their team had. Greg, is there any, there's no such thing in, in the commercial world as oversaturation, is there? Oh, there is. But oftentimes what is one man's oversaturation is a, another man's just barely reaching exactly who we want to meet. So, so you, you know, we really make sure that we are trying to buy as efficiently as possible. Sometimes people are going to experience exhaustion because they watch too much damn television. But uh, I, I think that we, we, we sometimes make a knowing sacrifice of, of oversaturating some viewers in order to make sure that we're reaching others efficient. And, um, but that goes into every media planner, media planner's kit is that calculus. And Elizabeth, the new norm, it wasn't that long ago that if you bought a thousand points, the, 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 you know, if you bought a thousand points of television advertising in the political world, you were, that was a good statewide buy. Now, is it the standard, did you notice it's 2000 points, right? That's a standard for a good, statewide buy if you're a U.S. Senate candidate? I guess, but I also think that everything else that we're talking about up here about the ability to target ads and sort of burrow into programming and particular programs to find voters, you know, even if it's just a small slice of the viewers of that program, uh, those are the voters you need that we're sort of moving to a place where the GRP is still a helpful metric and there's nothing better out there but that there needs to be something better out there because it doesn't tell you if you're hitting your targeted voters. You still don't know the story. You just right. only know the impressions exactly. overall in the general. Exactly. And you still don't know. And then you factor in the earned media, and there are some ads that probably ran you know, far fewer GRPs but still made a big impression, right, or did what they were supposed to do, and some ads that ran you know, much higher and didn't do what they were supposed to do. Another question out here? 
Sorry, there's bright light, so I'm, I'm not seeing hands raised. So apologies. You're making her work. Hi, Wayne Johnson. Um, I had a question. If, if as we move to set box targeting and, and as broadcast figures out how they're going to do the same sort of thing, uh, do we as an industry need to be proactive in looking at the LUR rates and how that's going to mess up, you know, how we as buyers deal with TV stations? If we're buying a different spot in different programming and chasing different audiences, is I mean, are we going to get beyond where the law is today? Or, or do you get the lowest unit rate? I guess. All right. So, ask about the answer the law question, Jim. But I'm just curious. Did you also were you guys trying to do things that TV stations couldn't handle in buying? No, look, I, I think we got a lot of help from all of uh, the different through the different buying services that we're working with and um, essentially what we were trying to do is not just look at it in terms of gross rating points or whatever uh, that we tried to construct essentially a dashboard with as much detail as we possibly could I guess this is a, you know this is part of the advice no matter what level of campaign that you're operating at trying to get as many data points as possible so that we weren't just measuring what a TV impression was we were calculating and looking at a dashboard that told us door knocks, phone calls, TV, radio, every, you know, what, what we were delivering essentially through all of these different mediums to try to get a sense of what we were actually connecting with that individual. That's where we're trying to go. In terms of low screen rate, I mean, I think that we will continue, I mean, for us, this, is, this was a critical advantage for the reasons we were just talking about a moment ago of, of being able to have lowest unit rate. We locked in very, very early within the Obama campaign and made adjustments as we went through the process. Um, I don't know about what the legal implications would be because I guess in theory, we would still have you know, the opportunity to buy at lowest unit rate, so you may want to take another yeah, I would just, I, I, yeah, to be, you're going to have a lowest unit rate, but if you're going to start breaking up that program uh, between one group of, of people you're going to pull out because they're, ah, they're voters you're chasing and then the, the residual is going to be sold, you know, to Taco Bell, you know, is there going to be a premium that's going to be charged and, you know. Yeah. And shouldn't we charge yeah. you a premium? I mean, to let you do what you're trying to do. But would the law allow it? Yeah, yeah should we be charged? Yeah. Or are you going to you guys going to fight for this? Come on now. You want us to do all this extra work for you, for your sophistication. <laughs> no, I'm We're in, doing the work. We're figuring it all out. Where you, uh, <laughs> Greg, well, you deal with that. I mean, is, is, the, is, the, uh, is the world of, is, is my world ready for this? Can they handle it? And how, and how is, what is this new world going to look like as far as bringing up this issue, which is, do they still get this discounted rate if they're not buying the entire, the entire? Uh, I think that it, ultimately it's a buyer's market with you guys. So I think that it's going to be. I this economy is going to turn around at some right, point. Right. Okay. So no. <laughs> but I, don't I, say. I think look, it, it's like any other kind of uh, uh, supply and demand issue. Actually, it's, it's going to the market will decide the level to which you guys have to absorb that versus the level to which these, these guys have to, to shoulder, shoulder that burden. But I think that uh, uh, on, the, on the media side, I think you guys should. I think you should be proactive and help them. Help them, help them do this, not yeah. charge more. Help yes. them figure this out. Yes. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, you brought up something. You said the gross rating point system. What is it that the TV industry should change as far as trying to help the advertising, political advertising world better. <laughs> You're saying the gross, ratings, the, the gross ratings points is sort of a, not a good way to measure. Oh no, I'm saturation. simply saying that the sophistication of the targeting efforts, is, it's advanced beyond the point where we, knowing your impressions for, when you place buy, it's helpful, but you, know, you still don't know if you're aiming at a particular program and you really are focusing only on a couple thousand people who are watching Gomer Pyle or something else, you want to know that you hit them, that they were watching. And so there's just somewhere out there, I think media buyers would say, is a better metric that combines GRPs with everything else. And the Obama campaign probably you know, got much closer to figuring out what that is. But I would ask Jim whether they're there. I think 
you're still trying to figure out what's the ideal metric that's going to tell you whether your advertising is, is hitting home. And are you there or is this something our industry needs to like get there? I, I mean, look, increasingly we're getting there because increasingly as we can see whether that addressability, I, I, I mean again, and I'm going to screw this up so it's people out there who have the technical expertise should jump in. You know, the way this is going to work, or the way it works now, is that overnight you drop into that set-top box the content, the ads, that you want to get delivered to that specific house the next day. Or when they turn on the That's the where this technology is going. That's, that's where the technology is for addressability. So that for Chuck's house, who's a persuadable because he's not a Democrat, he's in fact an independent voter who doesn't know which way to go. Um, we're going to do, we're going to do, we're going to do a persuasion ad to him. And, you know, for Elizabeth, we're going to, she's, she's already with us and we're going to deliver to her the get out the vote. And in fact, she's an early voter. And so we got to get to her sooner. That's because I don't want to see the ads anymore. I want you guys to invent that switch so I can turn them all exactly on. Right. So we're going to try to figure out when in her state early vote is because she's an early voter and she's with us. And we're going to drop into her set-top box the spots that are get out the vote. And then overnight, that comes in, and then this is where we're going. Right. It's going to start to push out. Now, I told you we did $450 million worth of advertising. We did a million dollars this way. So wait, wait the, say that again. One million dollars. So it's an experiment. Because it's just emerging. It, it, we're, we're like, were there some markets that couldn't do it? Was there only a few markets? Were there only a few oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, this is still in a formative stage. I think like Allstate is dropping in for <coughs> renters. Get it? We're going to sell rental insurance to renters. So they've done the data on who are the renters and where they live and all of that. Mm -hmm. And they're going to drop into their set-top box if you need renters insurance, right? So that's where the technology is beginning to go. This isn't going to happen in 14 where 80% of our stuff's going this way, but this is kind of where the future So Joanna, is. this would solve your Chicago problem. I mean, this could transform congressional district advertising in a way. Completely. In, in a way that would be more, in, more transformative than the presidential. Completely. Um, I mean, I think the more you can target anywhere, you know, the more that us as, you know, as, as media vendors are going to buy from, you know, a, broadcast cable, whoever, that's actually, I mean, when you think about like when we sit down with a candidate and we present to them, this is what we could do and this is how we could target. When you show them digital, I mean, they salivate over the fact that you can tell them, I know exactly where your potential voter, what sites they visit and what they look like and we'll tell you every detail we get back from it. If we have the ability to tell them that about cable advertising, about broadcast, about whatever it is, I mean this candidate is going to want to spend just as much more. So um, I think, you know, we definitely have work to do, but I think, you know, every station, everyone else has work to do too. If we can work at this together, clearly we're going to want to buy more if we can target more. There you go. I have to set that box thing. I'm starting to warm up to it. <laughs> Another question out there? We got one over here. We get the mic. Over to you. It's coming behind you. Just what about issues as opposed to presidentials? Issue advertising. Um, when you, your specific question being what? Well, you're talking about being so cluttered at election time. Now there's a gun control conversation. Is that impacting the next presidential? When you place ads on guns today, are you building for the Democratic line later? Is that part of the early narrative of the next presidential campaign? Want to jump in on this? I feel like I've. Go ahead. We're seeing more ads that contain what we call call to action messages call your senator, call your House member. We're seeing more ads. Those kinds of messages are making up a greater share of the advocacy advertising that we're seeing out there right now. So, in that way, you could say the 2014 campaign is starting really early because we're seeing more ads saying call Mary Landrieu about X, Y, or Z or call. Senator so and so. But overall, in terms of advocacy advertising, you know, we're seeing half as much spending on advocacy advertising that we saw four years ago at this time, about 30% less than we saw two years ago at this time. There's just not much advocacy advertising out there. I know everyone's <coughs> focusing on guns because that's the big fight right now, but there actually isn't that much being spent even on that yet. It's all relative, so that's the big issue. But 
There's just not very much in general. Why? Why? Uh, Is this an economy issue? Could be an economy issue. Could be, you know, historically, um, stakeholders in immigration haven't spent an enormous amount of money on advertising. The sequester not didn't generate a lot of advertising. Fiscal issues don't usually. We're not seeing much healthcare advertising right now. Just sort of the, you know, obviously the first year of a president's first term is going to generate a lot, but you know, the first year of a president's second term doesn't generate very much, and a Congress that doesn't do very much also doesn't help for advocacy <laughs> advertising. So there just aren't that many big fights. We're all talking about Mike Bloomberg and his twelve million dollars, which I don't think has been entirely spent yet. But that's because, you know, again, it's all relative, and that's the big, that's the big fish out there right now. Joanna, let me twist the question a little bit, and my apologies for doing this, but it goes to something Jim was talking about with the Romney campaign. Mm -hmm. And I think this is actually a problem that's 10 times greater on a congressional level, which is outside groups controlling message on yeah. a congressional way. This is, the, this is the sort of, to me, the great challenge of somebody running for Congress uh, in, in 2014, is that outside groups, I think, are going to be the dominator. Look well, what Michael Bloomberg did in the special election in Chicago. Right. He created the, he set the agenda with, an, uh, with outside groups. Right. Well, I mean, you know, the NRCC and the DCCC spend more usually than a candidate does in, 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 in a race. But I think um, we kind of, ha that, that gives you the advantage that, you know, like Jim was saying, the Obama campaign had. The candidate, you know, can assume that, or knows when they see a competitive that there's a third party group here so they can control their positive message. Um, so they do have more control over their message. Usually, I mean, 98% of the time, the outside group is gonna go 100% negative. So they- True, but we're seeing a different way that outside groups are being used now. Mm -hmm. So the Michael, you know, which is this issue, you know, trying to change the issue landscape. That to me is gonna be the great challenge, no? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, I mean, with super PACs and with un, unlimited, you know, sometimes unlimited um, contributions, you are able, I mean, I would say the one thing you're going to see that has, that has, that kind of brings together issue advocacy in 2014 is the fact the only issue advocacy ads you're seeing are for senators who are going to be up in 2014. So um, it kind of allows you to... Um, hold a couple of, you know, if you're an, uh, someone who's advocating for a certain issue, kind of hold a certain Democrat, a certain Republican kind of hostage and remind them, you know, hey, if you want to be, if, if you want to be reelected, I'm going to be here attacking you if, if you don't vote this way on an issue. Um, that's a huge change that I think wasn't around in the, in the super PAC days. All right. I got good news. We're over our time. <laughs> uh, but I want to close with a prediction question, which is, how soon before television ad uh, appears on my screen that says, hi Chuck, I want to <laughs> sell you, whether it's selling me, all, selling me toothpaste, Greg, or trying to persuade me to can it. How close are we to the actual personal lot where the person's name gets used in the way direct mail is done today? You have, you, it, it's a permissioning issue because you need that fi privacy firewall. You can get the yeah. data to extrapolate from the set-top box, but you can't give away who that person is. I should so hope so. You, you have to opt into, talk to me directly, which is kind of freaky. But uh, Do you think people will want to do that in this day and age of social media? Isn't it, it when, when oddly it becomes, enough, younger voters will be comfortable If it's with. tied to value-added, if it's tied to utility, if it, be, if it drops my, if it, if it enables me to, to do something else more cheaply, I'm sure that they could they'll build packages that will make it valuable to a consumer to, to opt into that level of targeting. But you probably also will have a lower value target. How, how soon? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, we only focus on television advertising. Well, <laughs> someone could air, air a spot during your show that says, Well, they hey, could Chef. do that. No, and I, <laughs> but I mean in my living where, I'm, where it goes, takes what Jim was describing to that next level. How far away are we? I'll say 2020, we'll start seeing. Yeah, I mean, are you going to try it in 2016, you think? I mean, I, I, I think that there are actually some issues about being able to, to right. I don't think we'll be there in 16. Um, I, I will say that, for example, with online, we are now able to change online virtually mm -hmm. like that. And by the way, you do this, the and permissions are already there online. Right. It isn't dear friend. That, you know, it is. Right. And it works so much better. Apparently, we agreed to terms and our terms and conditions 
when we check those boxes, do you put in the fine print, also we want to address you by name? I mean, <laughs> is that Hi, Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, if it's going to be online, how soon does it slip to television? I mean, even as someone who wants to target a ton, I think that's pretty frightening to have someone say your name on your own television. I think I'm going to go back to what you were saying about intrusive. being a little bit too intrusive. That's a little bit too intrusive. I think, um, especially on candidate ad advertising, it's much better to see them at an event and call them by name than on their television screen. <laughs> I hope you're all right. Well, this is great. <laughs> We tried to get into the weeds for you guys because I was told you guys wanted a weedy, weedy panel. I hope we were weedy enough, uh, and I hope we scared everybody uh, <laughs> about privacy issues. Anyway, thanks to a great panel.